All right. Again, we've all heard, if you have a group that's strung up and down, it's your breathing. Well, nine times out of ten, the human body wants to stop breathing when you start focusing on the front sight post because as you breathe, the front sight post moves up and down in position. Well, we all know you don't want to shoot while the rifle's actually moving, so everybody's natural tendency is to stop breathing, hold the rifle still, and then break the shot. So unless you're physically watching the shooter and seeing them breathe up and down as they're breaking shots, you can't tell them that breathing is the problem here. All that you can tell them is that the front sight post was pointed in five different points on the target as they broke each shot. Right, that's all that you can tell by analyzing a target like that. All right, here we have three different five shot groups on the same target. All right, they're all three very tight groups is what you want to see. What you can tell from a, from a target like this where the shooter fired three individual groups and each group is in a different place is that, that tar the shooter was probably aiming at a different spot, spot on that target for each group. All right, this is um, normally caused by not knowing exactly what center mass is supposed to look like. The shooter saw center mass here for one group, shot a good tight group right in the center. The next group, after they reloaded magazines, got back down in position, got on the rifle, looked through the sights, they held a little bit higher than, than their normal center mass, and they shot a group a little bit high in the chest. Again, the shooter reloads the magazine, gets back down to position. His next group he held just a little bit lower than center mass, and he shoots a group a little bit low. All right, this is simply due to the shooter not knowing what exact center mass looks like. And we have a few tips that help you show a shooter what center mass should look like down range. If you take a 25 meter zero target and take a piece of masking tape and cover up the entire bottom half of that target, and then let the shooter look down range to the sights and come straight up to the bottom of the target, they can tell exactly what they should be seeing above the front sight post. This is going to give them a good representation of what they need to see for each shot group that they shoot. This should help the shooters get more center mass because they're going to see the same thing over the front sight post each shot in between each group as well. Another thing that you can do on a 25 meter zero range is take a, a permanent marker be it red or green or not necessarily black and draw a pretty thick line about one centimeter wide across this dead center of the 25 meter zero target and have it extend a few inches out on each side of that target. As the shooter comes up and approaches the target with the sighting system, they're going to come up and they're going to be able to see that line sticking out on either side of their front sight post, which gives them a reference point of when to stop pushing up into the target or if they're low, they're gonna see that the front sight post is lower than that center mass line, and they can see what, they're, what they actually need to see once they line the sight up with the line on target. All right, again, this is just to show that shooter what they need to see above the front sight post in order to hold a consistent center mass hold. Okay, here we have a shooter that, again, shot three very tight five-shot groups, but they're all three spread out in different places, all right? And on this group, on a target like this rather, the point of aim is probably not the problem. You can just about guarantee that that shooter didn't aim at the lower left corner for one group, aim off the right shoulder for one group, and then aim off the left side of the head for one group. The shooter was more than likely holding what they thought was center mass, so the point of aim is probably not the problem. All right. The proper application of fundamentals within each five shot group is correct. That's what allows them to shoot good tight groups. They're correctly aligning the sights for five shots in a row. They're correctly breaking clean shots for five shots in a row. What we're seeing between these three five shot groups is either a misalignment of the sights or an indicator of poor natural point of aim. If that shooter is muscling that rifle around for each shot, they're not comfortable you can get groups that shift around like this between each group. If that shooter is misaligning the air or misaligning the sights on target, you can get groups that shift around. They're doing it consistently inside the five shot group, but they're doing it inconsistently between groups. This could be an indicator that that shooter is misaligning the sights between each group. They're doing it consistently in that five shot group, but every time they get down on the target, they're changing their sight alignment to shoot that five shot group. All right, so make sure they understand what true center mass of the rear sight aperture looks like. Um, a lot of times I'll draw it on a piece of paper. Okay, this is your rear sight aperture. The front sight post has to be perfectly centered vertically and horizontally inside that rear sight aperture. 
every single shot and a, each individual group. Okay, here we have a five shot group that's fairly well centered up. You have four good solid shots and then one shot that's way outside the group. More than likely the shooter just made a bad shot, meaning they either jerked the trigger or they got a little bit anxious and kind of shouldered the rifle a little bit for that one shot. So you're not going to make any kind of corrections off of that one bad shot. A lot of times the, sh the shooter knows that they've done this and they can tell their coach, yep, I shot a bad shot in that group. Uh, your other four shots are center mass, so you don't need to make any side corrections. Okay, and here we have a gigantic five shot group where all five shots are spread out over the target. Okay, the shooter could be making one or multiple fundamental errors here that cause them to shoot a group this big. Remember that you can't tell what the shooter is doing by looking at the target itself. You have to watch the shooter. Ensure that the shooter has good solid head pressure. Ensure that the shooter has a good solid position. Ensure that they're staying smooth on the trigger. They're not slapping the trigger and letting off really quick. You want to squeeze the trigger nice and smoothly. The rifle fires, they're holding the trigger to the rear, and then they release and you hear that metallic click. Okay. Have the shooter aim at a smaller area of the target, say the head, uh, to help them focus in on a smaller area, which might help them shrink that group down. Okay, and then once they start shooting better groups, show them what true center mass should look like on the target by using, drawing a line across the, the center of the target or by covering up the bottom half. That way they know what true center mass looks like and then have them shoot, again, those five shot groups at center mass on the target to ensure their zero is good. All right, so the next thing that we're going to cover is wind and weather and the effect that has on the shooting that we do. All right, wind has the greatest effect on the bullet and on ballistic trajectories. All right, the amount of effect depends on the time the projectile is exposed to the wind, the direction the wind is blowing in relation to the bullet, and the velocity of the wind. Okay, so for wind estimation, we need to know how fast the wind is blowing. All right, from zero to three miles per hour, uh, wind can hardly be felt on the skin, but smoke drifts. All right, your three to five mile per hour wind will be felt lightly on the face and skin. Um, the grass or leaves will barely start moving. All right, five to eight miles per hour, those leaves will stay in constant motion. You'll see them swaying a little bit. All right, at eight to 12 miles per hour, you're gonna see dust and loose paper, leaves and stuff blowing across the ground pretty quickly. And then at that 12 to 15 miles per hour, um, your trees, your big limbs on trees and stuff are going to sway pretty hard. Uh, so that'll give you that 12 to 15 mile an hour range if you see the trees really swaying a lot. Okay, now we need to figure out which direction the wind is blowing in relation to the bullet. <clears throat> All right, we use what we call the clock system. You as the shooter are in the center of the clock. Your target is downrange at 12 o'clock. All right, a wind coming in from your 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock or from your 11 o'clock to your 5 o'clock is known as a half value wind. All right, a wind coming in from your nine o'clock or your three o'clock or you know two to eight, or 10 to four, anywhere in that window is blowing pretty much directly across your position. It's gonna be what we call a full value wind. It's gonna have the most effect on the bullet. Okay, and a wind coming in from your 12 o'clock or from your six o'clock, doesn't matter how fast that wind is blowing, it's what we call a no value wind. It has just about no value on the bullet. It won't move the bullet at all as it flies down range. All right, so now we have a wind formula for the 5.56 cartridge that we shoot out of the M16. Okay, this wind formula is pretty simple. You do your range in meters. Again, you only use the first number of that range times the velocity of the wind in miles per hour, and you divide that by a constant of seven. All right, that constant of seven is for the 5.56 cartridge. If you're shooting a different caliber weapon, that constant number is different. Okay, and this is gonna give you your minute of angle and drift on the target. Okay, so here's an example. You have target at 400 meters, you have a seven mile per hour wind blowing at full value across your line of sight. So you do four times seven divided by seven gives you four minutes of angle. Four minutes of angle at 400 meters gives you 16 inches of drift down range. So if you're shooting at that target, you have that full seven mile per hour wind blowing across the position, you need to hold about 16 inches upwind of center in order for that bullet to come in and hit the center of your target. All right, here we have a quick worksheet just to help you um, kind of get your mind wrapped around how this formula works. We have five different problems. We're gonna go through them and give you a second to try to figure out what each problem uh, would be. So you have a 300 meter target, a 10 mile an hour full value wind. So you do 
you take your 3, multiply it times 10, divide by your constant of 7, and it gives you 4.2 minutes of angle. All right, we're going to round that down to 4 minutes of angle for ease of movement of the sights. So 4 minutes of angle at 300 meters gives you a total of 12 inches of movement downrange at the target. All right, your next one, you have 500 meters and a 7 mile per hour full value wind. So you take your 5 times 7, multiply that, divide it by your constant of 7, and it gives you 5 minutes of angle. Again, 5 minutes of angle at 500 meters is 25 inches of drift at the target. So you really need to compensate for that or you'll miss completely off the target. Your next problem is 600 meters at 15 miles per hour. So 6 times 15 divided by your constant of 7 gives you 12.8 minutes of angle. We're going to round up to 13 minutes. 13 minutes at 600 meters is a lot. All right, your next one is 400 meters at a 20 mile per hour wind. So again, you take your four of your yardage, multiply that times 20, divide it by the constant of seven, and it gives you 11.4. All right, you can round that to 11 for ease of movement on the sights. And your last one is 100 meters at 14 miles per hour, one times 14, 14 divided by seven, gives you two minutes of angle. That only moves you two inches at 100 meters. All right, so you have the same five problems, but now we're gonna talk about a half value win. A half value win, remember, is coming in at that two o'clock angle. It's gonna have half the amount of effect of drift on that bullet. So you do the same thing, three times, all right, 300 meters, at 10 miles per hour, 3 times 10 divided by your constant of 7 gives you that 4.28. Divide that by 2 because it's a half value wind and it gives you roughly 2 minutes of angle of drift. Again, that 2 minutes of angle at 300 meters means that wind is going to blow your bullet approximately 6 inches. Same thing, 5 times 7, 500 meters, 7 miles per hour divided by your constant of 7 gives you 5 minutes of angle. Divide that by 2 because it's a half value wind gives you 2.5 minutes of angle. All right, 2.5 minutes of angle at 500 meters, roughly 12 inches. All right, 600 meters at 15 miles per hour. Again, six times 15 divided by the constant of seven, 12.8 divided by two gives you 6.5 MOA. All right, 400 meter target, 20 mile an hour, full value wind, or half value wind rather. You do 400 meters times 20 miles per hour divided by your constant of 7. Gives you that 11.4, which you're going to round to 11. All right, divide that 11 by 2. Gives you 5.5 minutes of angle. And then the last one, 100 meters, 14 mile per hour wind. 1 times 14 divided by your constant of 7. Gives you a 2 minute of angle. Divide that by 2, and that wind's going to push you approximately 1 minute of angle on the target. Okay, so when you're... Determining a wind trends downrange, you have to look at various indicators between you and the target. So you you know that a zero to three mile per hour wind is lightly felt on the face. You need to make sure it's doing the same thing downrange of the target. So you look for indicators between you and the target. All right, so you observe the indicators for wind speed, the direction, and the value at half to two thirds of the way down the range. That's where it's gonna have the most effect on that bullet. The bullet's starting to slow down, the bullet's higher in the air, meaning it's going to be affected more by air uh, that's moving a little bit higher above the brush. All right, so that's what you need to be looking for indicators downrange. All right, so you observe downrange, look for you know leaves moving or the trees swaying, the grass moving to pick up direction and wind speed, and then watch downrange that two thirds to halfway mark downrange to, to try to figure out the velocity and what it's going to do to your bullet. All right, another way you can try to pick up what the wind is doing downrange is through the use of optics to watch the mirage. All right, the mirage is nothing more than the different layers of, of heat coming off the ground, and the wind blows that, that different temperature air, and you can see it looking, looks like water running across the top of the ground. All right, so you can use your optics to watch the mirage to indicate you know, your wind speed, the direction, and to detect possible changes versus the wind letting off or picking up. Um, you know, if you see it moving faster, the wind's picking up. If you see it letting off and the mirage boiling straight up, the wind is completely stopped and it's not going to have the effect on the bullet.